I'm really excited about this topic. Let me just uh, present myself. I'm a technical agile coach with Pragma, and I have written a book a few years ago, The Coding Dojo Handbook, and do find me on Twitter or send me an email. So this is a software a conference about software craftsmanship, and I have to, of course, go back and talk about Agile. Um, the Agile Manifesto, uh, Bob already mentioned this this morning, and this has been absolutely transformational for the software industry. This has changed the way that almost every software team now develops software. Um, and this is, this is fantastic uh, compared with what we had before. So I, I still remember my first job, our software process. We had a, a set of 13 binders about this thick on a shelf, and that was our software development process. And you had to understand the whole thing before you could do software, basically. It was, it was a different age. So I'm very happy about Agile. I wanted to uh, just tell you an anecdote about some software developers who were Agile. And this is uh, software in space. This is the Cygnus uh, module, which was supposed to dock with the International Space Station. So they launched this multi-million pound uh, piece of hardware and it was in orbit, and it was supposed to approach the ISS and dock with it. When they discovered a problem with the software, the, the language of the GPS coordinates that the, the module was talking was different from the, the format that the ISS expected, and they were unable to agree on their locations, so they couldn't get close enough to one another to dock. So obviously this was uh, a big disaster and the, the scientists in charge of the mission called a press conference and they said, well, obviously we're very disappointed that we weren't able to dock with the space station today, but it's okay because we are going to patch the software and we expect to successfully dock within a few days. So I hope they'd actually cleared this with the software team first um, because it did actually take them a week. Uh, before they successfully docked, but they were able to do this. They patched the software in this module that was flying around the world at several thousand kilometers an hour, and they patched the software and up updated the uh, GPS format, and they were able to dock. So this is a story of a successful, agile software delivery in space. What could be better than that? So this is, I think, the fundamental uh, point with Agile, is that we want to do these Agile methods so that we can respond to change, so that we can update our software as frequently as, as is needed by the business, or in this case, the scientists. So that's kind of a, one of the fundamental pieces of this. So if I'm thinking about, well, how, how quickly can I respond? I've been asked to build a feature. I'm making an analogy here with being asked to bake a cake. There is a part of um, how long it's going to take me, how hard this is, which is directly related to how hard is this feature. Is this a cake with many layers? Is this many types of icing? Are there many ingredients that I need to worry about? Is this an essentially a very complex cake I've been asked to build or make? Um, but that's not all. In order to know how I'm going to be able to succeed at this, I also need to know about the environment I'm going to be working in. I need to know something about the kitchen and how clean, clean it is, how well prepared it is, what tools I've got available to me, and what kind of um, infrastructure is available. And I think it's the same in software. The, the feature can be inherently very complex, but it also matters a great deal how good your environment is. How quickly can I understand the existing design? How clean is it? How quickly can I verify that my change actually works and doesn't break something? How quickly can I regression test everything else? And then, when it comes to deployment, as, is the tools and infrastructure in place to put that thing into production? And is there monitoring and observability to check that it didn't break something when it was in production? So I think this is, um, this is a really important part of being agile. It's not just the things we're being asked to build, but the environment we're building it in. So for me, when I'm talking about technical agility, I'm talking about the kind of the engineering, the infrastructure around the system that is going to be directly impacting how agile I can be. And actually, it's the foundation of any agile method. I mean, these days, it's very fashionable with Scrum and, and Safe and Kanban. And these agile methods are, are great. I have no problem with, with whichever one of these you want to be doing. 
But I think it's very important to remember that whichever one you have, you still need to have the technical agility in place as well. This picture was already in Bob's slides. So I was very happy to see it because extreme programming was the, the first agile method that I came across when I read this book back in, in 2000. And if you look at this agile method, extreme programming, it's got the technical practices right at the center. And this is important for, for being agile. This is something that you need if you're going to keep delivering that software at the pace that the business needs it. And I think the, the later Agile methods didn't all emphasize this, which I think is a mistake. So I'm very happy to see so many people at this conference who I hope will also have seen this importance, that actually it's very hard to be Agile if you're working in a mess. And that's true of cooking, and I think it's true of coding. I want the cost and the um, difficulty of building a new feature to be dominated by how difficult that feature is, not by how dreadful my kitchen looks. So I want uh, to be working in an agile environment with the technical stuff in place. And when I go out consulting, um, I spend a lot of time working with, with teams, different teams, different code bases, and I see a lot of unagile code. And unagile infrastructure. There's, there's been a lot of uh, some changes there, but it's still, I see a lot of places where, um, as I mentioned before, features just take longer to build than they should because of all the accidental complexity that the, the developers have to deal with. Then there's the, uh, the time it takes to bring on board new team members. And this, uh, some places you're thinking you bring a competent developer onto the team, but it's six months before they can produce any code independently or in any, and that's, that's a big cost. And then there's the, uh, the bugs that you get introduced because people don't understand the system well enough to reason about it. So they inadvertently uh, introduce bugs, which costs. And then there's the problem of not being able to use the latest tools and technologies that you've, you've painted yourself into a corner and you have such strong dependencies on the old versions of some ancient frameworks that you can't get, get and use all the advantages of the more modern uh, frameworks. So these are all things that you can actually talk about with your manager and in terms that they will understand. These are costs due to you not having an agile code base and an agile technical infrastructure. So I want to see a, a code base where you have lots of test automation, you have continuous integration, um, you have a good cohesive decoupled architecture, your design is testable, you have some deployment automation. All of these things are to, going to directly influence how agile you can be. And this is the stuff that I get interested in. So um, I really wanted to, uh, to bring it down actually a little bit more focused than this is general technical agility. I want to talk about technical agility actually in the code base. And this is where software craftsmanship comes in. We're talking about engineering skills. And a key skill here is test-driven development. And I'm not the first person to mention this today, but it really is a very important skill to have. And I was so encouraged to see so many of you here today uh, are practicing this. So I want to, uh, I usually introduce this and try and explain why I think this is such an important practice. So firstly, when you're writing the tests first in your code, you're verifying that the code does what you think it does. And that's very important. That means that there is a, a match between what's in my head and what's in my computer. It may be that what's in my head is wrong, and hopefully you'll discover that at some point. But it's a very good start if there's a match between what I believe the system does and what the tests show me that it does in practice. Then there's the, the way that TDD gets you to break your changes into small pieces. Uh, one test at a time, I'm building up the functionality. And this means that I'm, I'm maintaining a flow of, of a development, and I have an opportunity every time the tests are passing, I can decide to share my work with others. Then there's the, the benefits for your design. Now, if you're writing unit tests, that forces there to be units, which is a good start when it comes to creating code with high cohesion and low coupling. It doesn't guarantee 
that you are going to turn into a fantastic designer overnight. Unfortunately, it's still possible to write bad code with TDD, but I think it helps. So it gives you a push in a good direction. Then there's the refactoring support that you get when you've got that huge suite of unit tests. That means you, you have confidence to improve your code and improve your design. And then, of course, the most important reason is that it feels good to work this way. It's a fun way to work. It's very satisfying in my experience. When, it, when this is working, this is a really fun thing to do. So I recommend it to you warmly. Now, TDD has not become the standard in the industry, as already noted by Bob. And I think the analogy I usually use to explain why this is the case is, to, is, is skiing. I don't know if you've learned to ski or you've seen somebody else learn to ski. Um, but it's the thing that happens is that you want to be this person here, whizzing down the mountain on a, a really clear day with beautiful snow and you're going really fast. Um, but you have to start out doing what this guy is doing, which is a, a snow plow, which is what you teach every beginner when they first get on a pair of skis. It's how you get down an easy slope. It doesn't take long to learn. And uh, the snowplow technique is good. You, can, you know how to brake. It works. But the thing is, it can't take you all the way up the mountain. If you want to be this guy whizzing down the really uh, steep slopes, snowplow doesn't work. It's not, uh, you can't brake. You can't turn with that technique. You have to learn this other technique, which is parallel turns. And the thing is, I see a lot of this happen uh, with my children as they've learned to ski. You learn the snowplow really quickly, and then you can get down most slopes using that technique. But you really need to learn this other technique, which is harder, much harder. It's a completely different way of, of skiing. And it's so easy when you get a little bit scared, or it gets a bit steep, you just revert to doing snowplow, because it's what you know, and it's, it's easy. And I think it's like that with TDD. You can learn it, you can learn to do TDD, but it's such a different technique from how you've, you've learnt originally that as soon as you get a bit stressed, there comes a deadline, the code's a bit tricky, you just revert to writing the test last or not at all. So I think this is, this is why TDD is so hard. It's, it's a so different technique from how we normally do it and how we're normally taught. So I've, um, for some years now, I've been doing uh, coding dojos as a way to help people to get familiar with test-driven uh, development um, using uh, exercises. And I wrote this book a few years ago, um, which has been fairly successful at, well, I've sold a few books at least. I hope people have been doing this. Um, so at a coding dojo meeting, you get together a bunch of programmers, like this is a, a photo of one of the meetups where we did a, a coding dojo. And you, you discuss some code, and you write some code, and you practice. And um, generally, it takes two or three hours, uh, this meeting. And, and uh, the, the idea is that you, you get together a bunch of programmers, and you improve at programming and learn TDD. Code Carter is an exercise that you do. Um, it's, again, the same analogy with, with karate and martial arts. You're, it's a practice exercise that you do and you get good at. Um, to show that you've learned a technique. Um, the analogy isn't perfect, but um, I think the great value of being able to do TDD in a code carter is that it teaches you what it feels like when you're doing TDD. <laughs> it teaches you that, that feeling of when you can do a code carter, you can get that flow through it, and you can uh, realize that, OK, I can do TDD now on a problem that looks like this. It's a, um, if I can do the leap years carter, uh, that's a carter where you have to write a function that takes an integer a year and returns a Boolean, whether it's a leap year or not. And I can uh, practice and learn to test drive that particular function. And then I've got the idea of that. And then if in my production code at some later date I discover a, a, a place where I need a function that takes an integer and returns a Boolean, Maybe I could test drive that in my production code. That's always been the, the kind of um, the idea. You practice on a simple exercise, and then you can transfer that skill into your production code. Now, this is, this is great in theory, but in practice, a lot of production code um, isn't really amenable to this. It's kind of like I'm going back to my skiing now. We're off karate. We're back on skiing. 
Um, it's kind of like you go into your production code to try out your, your parallel turns, and you discover the piece looks like this. And you're like, oh, I think I'm going to do snowplow. Whereas if the piece looked like, like this, you know, this is like, oh, I want my snowboard. Um, that's where you can actually perhaps be successful with your TDD. So the problem is I see a lot of uh, production code that looks a lot more like the moguls. And uh, it's a lot harder to do TDD there. And I've found um, that with all the coding dojos I've done, a lot of people have become proficient at doing TDD on simple exercises, but then been unable to transfer that skill into the production code. And that's always bothered me. <laughs> so I really want to know how I can improve behavior in production code. And this is where I would really like to talk to you about technical agile coaching, which is uh, something I've been uh, doing recently and found to be remarkably successful in a way. Um, so I had this experience uh, earlier this year. I was invited by Llewellyn Falco to join him at one of his clients. And I worked with him at the clients for a week. And I observed how he was working. And I observed that the teams he was working with had actually started to change their behavior in the production code. And that really impressed me, <laughs> because that's something I haven't seen so much. So I, I was very pleased to have this experience. And one of the things that, that Llewellyn was doing was a coding dojo-like um, sessions, but he was also doing mob programming. Now, mob programming, um, you may have heard of this. I really like uh, Woody Zool's definition, where he says, this is all the brilliant people working on the same thing at the same time, in the same space, on the same computer. And that is... That is what it is. It's a bit like pair programming, only you get your whole team to do it together. So you, uh, you get the setup like this, where you have a big screen. You have one person controlling the keyboard and entering the code into the computer. And you have the whole team collaborating in, to decide what code should be written. And this is, uh, I was very impressed with this. I think it's a transformational practice for a software team. And I do encourage you to look at either of these books or both. Uh, by, one is by Woody Zool and, and the other one's uh, Llewellyn is co-author. So uh, do check out these books um, if you'd like more detail on this. But I will summarize mob programming as um, it's not just that you get the whole team together on one keyboard. There's actually quite some disciplined roles that you have. So the, the navigator is a key role here. It's the person who is telling the driver what to type into the keyboard. And the, key, the, the driver is not allowed to have their own ideas about what to type. They may ask questions, but they, they don't decide what to type. That is the navigator. And if you are not the navigator or the driver, uh, your place in the mob is as a supporting role. And you should basically prefer not to speak. And if you do speak, it's best to phrase your um, utterance as a question a coaching question uh, to the navigator to try and prompt them into uh, another direction. And then, so that's while you're coding. And then quite frequently, the navigator will, will pause and uh, say, OK, we need to discuss this. I don't know what to do next. And then you, the whole team comes together and has a discussion, get the whiteboard out, um, talk about stuff until there's some consensus about where to go. And then the, somebody volunteers to navigate, and you go back to your roles. So this uh, is a very structured, um, disciplined way of, of working together that, um, as, a, as a coach, I, I work with a, a team and teach them this technique. Uh, and I find it very valuable. Because, firstly, I think I just wanted to, to reinforce this, that it's so valuable forcing people to verbalize a code change. The navigator has to speak in words what it is should be written into the editor. Uh, you force the, the, the code to go through um, words before it goes into the computer. And that means that everyone in the mob can hear the change that's going to be made. And they see somebody type the change that is, is made in the code. And this means that everyone in the mob 
has some understanding, a better understanding of, of the code than they would have got if they just typed it themselves or if they just watched somebody else type it. And this um, means that very quickly, if anyone in the mob knows something and they navigate that thing, then everyone in the mob knows that thing. And this means that uh, skills propagate very quickly within a mob. And as a, as a coach, um, I can uh, prompt the mob in a better direction. I can um, remind them, I, I think you might want to write a test now. <laughs> or uh, I think I can see some duplication here. Uh, perhaps we could refactor that. So I can, uh, as, a, as a coach for a mob, I can prompt them to, to work with test-driven development in the, in the production code. So I've had uh, experiences lately working with a, a couple of different teams doing this. And um, so I wanted to just tell you the story. One, one of the teams I work with, half of the uh, team was originally from India, the other half from Sweden. And they uh, had not worked together very long. And there was a big culture gap and a big um, collaboration problem in this team, communication problem. And I taught them the, the mob programming technique. And we were writing a few tests and doing TDD a bit, but mostly the value in that for that team was that it forced them to talk to each other. It forced them to explain code and design and agree and make a consensus about what code they were going to write. And that was the, the biggest win for that team um, from this, this whole coaching I did. Another team I worked with, um, in this case, the, the team was collaborating pretty well together. And they picked up mob programming very quickly. Um, but the problem for them was that they just lost a couple of their most senior team members, and the people left on the team were not very familiar with the code and the domain. And they were being asked to implement some really quite complex features. So I was um, coaching them more around, OK, how do we break this into small pieces? How do we write tests for this? How do we um, fake it? Because we can't get this test to write that we've just written to pass, so we'll, we'll fake it. So um, the value for that team was much more in and learning to break things down. Um, and so basically, as a coach, I'm able to support um, the team in, in what they need to, to learn and in terms of technical agile. So I mentioned already that we, Llewellyn was also doing some uh, learning hours, as he calls it. It's like a coding dojo, only it only lasts for one hour. And you do it every day. And you invite everyone in the, who's a programmer to attend um, as part of their normal daily routine. And at that session, you, you do code carters, and you um, discuss code, and you practice, and you learn theory. And this is uh, really valuable, um, because I, I mean, I, I've known for years that, that practicing on code carters is valuable for learning basic skills. Um, but it makes, this makes it part of your normal daily routine. This makes it normal for a programmer to spend some of their time at work learning stuff. And we're knowledge workers, and our industry moves so fast, we have to keep learning stuff. I mean, this is really important. And by putting it as part of the working day, it means that it's much more likely to happen than if you ask people to go away on their free time and practice this stuff. It's, uh, it should be part of our job to learn stuff. And this makes it explicit. So um, the kind of coaching that I was doing with Llewellyn, and I, now I've started doing myself, is a, a daily schedule like this, um, the learning hour there in the middle. And then I'm mob programming with uh, three different teams, two hours each, uh, during the rest of the day. Um, and the, there's a bit of slack time in there as well, where you can uh, have informal meetings with other people who need to perhaps do something uh, to help the, t the teams. So this is a daily routine for me as an agile coach. And then there's the engagement cycle, where I'm working intensively with uh, these teams for a two-week period. Two weeks is, is just long enough to actually move the needle so that a team changes its behavior from this to this. And then you go away um, and let the team consolidate what they've been learning, and try and do it for themselves. And then you come back, and you shift them another two weeks in, the, in a better direction. 
And this um, combination of, of uh, being there and not being there means that me, as a, as a coach, I need to make sure that all the time I'm teaching them things that they will be able to continue doing when I'm gone, because I'm going to be gone pretty soon. And they need, so it helps me to stay focused on what they actually need. And also, this time when I'm not at the, at the client coaching, then I can go to conferences. And um, I can <laughs> learn stuff myself. Because uh, as I mentioned, learning is really important. And I need to learn things so that I have something to, to offer when I'm uh, coaching. So um, some people have, have said to me, well, isn't this just what a, a tech lead should be doing? Um, yes, tech leads should be encouraging better technical practices and uh, encouraging uh, people to practice and learn stuff. Uh, but I think as a, as a coach, I, I have the um, added advantage that I'm not directly writing production code, whereas a tech lead probably is. And I have a time-limited engagement, which means that I'm totally focused on what am I teaching them that they can continue doing when I'm gone, whereas the tech lead normally has a much more long-term relationship with just one team. So there are, there are pros and cons of these different roles. Um, and I think uh, both can be very beneficial to a team. But I'm just uh, pretty, I'm, I'm really enjoying working as a technical agile coach. And uh, I think it's working really well. So you're sitting there thinking, OK, so how do I get myself one of these technical agile coaches? And well, I want to tell you about how I uh, got to do this. It was through this visiting coach program that Llewellyn set up. So Llewellyn um, set this up. He, he invited me and a number of other um, people in the industry to come and join him. Uh, so he, he has been working with this client for um, probably a year before I, I arrived. And I arrived halfway through one of his coaching blocks. And I stayed two weeks, um, so a week after he left. And I, he basically taught me how to work with his client the way he works with his client. And now I can do that with other clients. So it was learning from somebody. So the, the week that we overlapped, we led half of the learning hours each. And I was able to show some of my teaching materials to Llewellyn. And he showed some of his teaching materials to me. And of course, we taught the people at the client. Um, we also we worked with four teams. Normally, um, I think uh, if you're going to mob program two hours a day with uh, three teams, that's basically your capacity. With uh, two coaches, we took on four teams. So uh, two of the teams we coached together, and the other team uh, we had one you know separately. Uh, so I had one of the teams that was just mine to coach. Um, so it meant that um, when we were coaching together, when I first arrived and hadn't done a lot of mob programming. Um, Llewellyn was coaching the mob, and I was in the mob. And then by the end of the week, we'd swap roles. And I was coaching the mob, and Llewellyn was in the mob. And uh, that enabled me to very quickly learn how to coach a mob and do it in a way that was not disruptive to the, the, the people in the teams we were coaching. And then, of course, we could uh, re have a retrospective every day and discuss, well, this happened today in the, the mobbing session. What did you think about that? Or, or um, I, I'd like to give you some feedback on the way you coached the team through that situation. Um, so we were able to learn a lot from one another uh, during this uh, time. So I mentioned there was only a one week overlap. And this was a client that I'd never worked with before. Um, so Llewellyn very carefully set up opportunities for me to network within the client so that I could build relationships with the, uh, the client organization and uh, build some social capital so that I could be effective as a coach in the, in the wider organization. So I, I would eat lunch every day with a different person, um, just one-on-one. -on -one. It's much easier to have a, a meaningful conversation with somebody if it's just you and them. And lunch is a time when everyone is available. And usually. <laughs> so you go out, you take them out somewhere, and you get to know them. And just ask them about what their background is, and what their priorities are, and, and how, how things are going. And that gives you an opportunity to get to know the wider organization. 
And then when uh, Llewellyn had gone, I knew enough people well enough that I was still effective in coaching in that organization. I should also mention that I wasn't alone. Uh, there were other Agile coaches uh, around in the organization, and they were focusing on different aspects of Agile. So I was really focused on the code and the technical agility, and the TDD, and the refactoring, and the build process, and all these technical, really, really technical things. But there were other coaches who were working with the product management to make sure they, they were prioritizing the right kind of features, and um, there were coaches working with the... Uh, uh, on the, like the scrum master kind of role, uh, teaching the process. And all of these coaches together are helping that organization to very quickly increase their agility. And it's important as a technical agile coach to collaborate with those other roles. So this experience I found um, really helpful. I, I learned a lot of new coaching techniques. I learned this uh, style of mob programming. Um, which combined with the, the uh, learning hour seems to be so powerful. And uh, Llewellyn, as the, the coach receiving video visitors, gets a lot of feedback about his work and, and things he hadn't thought about. And the client organization is getting a, the benefit of more uh, perspectives, more coaching perspectives, and um, more experience to draw on, and more coaching days than one coach could provide. So this uh, seems to me that having a visiting coach program should benefit everyone involved in it. Um, and I was very glad to be involved in this one because I think there needs to be, there needs to be more technical agility in this world. A lot of the teams I'm working with, they've got uh, scrum masters, they've been sent on scrum master courses and product owners that have been sent on product owner courses, but the developers are still struggling with the technical side of Agile. And this seems to me as a way to spread that is to start having more technical agile coaching. And I want, and having a visiting coach program is a way to train more technical agile coaches. So I'd, I'd really um, hope to set up one of these. Um, it's early days yet. I haven't found a client yet that will support it, but at some point, I hope it's going to happen. So if you're sitting in the audience and thinking, well, I could be a technical agile coach. Yes, great. I, I, I would like to encourage that ambition. Um, if you want to be a technical agile coach, I think you need to have both technical skills and people skills. So I think you need to be good at TDD and refactoring and handling legacy code and, and doing design incrementally, all these really hard software development skills. But you also need to be an effective people person able to do facilitation um, when you're faced with a mob, to be able to s put those uh, coaching questions at the right moment and to know when to stay silent, that's actually really hard. <laughs> um, and you have to have the teaching skills in the, uh, the learning hour to be able to um, help people to understand the theory and to, to be successful when they're doing code carters. And just understanding people and motivations. This is the whole thing about understanding uh, how to collaborate with the other coaches and how to uh, collaborate with the, the managers in the client organization. So um, this, these are, are skills. This is a wide skill set. Um, but I think there are people who uh, have enough of these skills, and they can learn the others. And I would encourage you, if you're thinking about this, um, do come and talk to me. Um, and uh, I really hope that in a few years, there's going to be a lot more emphasis on the technical part of Agile. And, and how to get organizations to really embrace this stuff. So uh, this is my summary slide. Um, I've been talking about technical agile coaching. And uh, I've been mentioning that when you are, I started by explaining that how, how, much, how agile you can be is a combination of how hard is the thing you're trying to do and what is the environment you're doing it in. How messy is your code base? How poor is your infrastructure? So it's important not to ignore the, uh, the technical agile side of things. It will affect how agile you can be. And then I've been talking about um, this uh, way of this style of technical agile coaching, which I've started doing now, which I found effective, combining more programming with uh, learning our coding dojo style things. 
Then there's the uh, test-driven development, which is the key skill which I'm trying to teach when I'm working with teams. And it's a long process to teach this skill. It's, I think it's going to be um, more than one coaching block of two weeks. I could say that much. Um, then there's, I do want to emphasize how impressed I am with the power of mob programming um, to, to change behavior in production code. And the visiting coach uh, thing that I was able to benefit from, from being part of. And I hope that this isn't just going to be something that never happens again. I hope that this is a way of more coaches uh, coming up into the industry and, and affecting change. Because I think the, the whole agile movement has really changed our industry. It's, it's, it's great to see. But the, it's not going to be successful, really, in the long term, unless we can get the technical side of agile also in place and a way to really get organizations to embrace that. So I hope I've given you some food for thought. Thank you. OK, I think we've probably got time for a few questions. Yep. Um, a general question. General question about uh, the the role of a Scrum Master. I don't know if, if you have an ID. It's not uh, precisely precisely linked to your presentation. But uh, should the Scrum, Scrum Master uh, be an effective developer, for example? And more generally, do you have an, an uh, yeah should an ID of this profile? Okay. So the 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 Scrum Master. So um, I think if the Scrum Master has been a developer, that's an advantage. Uh, but if you stop coding, you become out of date with your technical skills very quickly. Uh, within a couple of years, it's, it's, it gets hard, much, much harder to get back to becoming a programmer again. And most Scrum Masters that I meet have stopped coding long enough ago that they're no longer technically sharp enough to coach a mob the way I do, for example. Um, and that's not to say that what they do isn't valuable. I think it's very valuable having an agile coach working with the team coaching the process and, and the, the way they interact with the stakeholders. I think that's very valuable, but I think it's rare to find a person that can combine that with being a technical agile coach and actually teaching skills like test-driven development. So although you may find some people who can do it, um, I think uh, for myself, um, I'm more effective if I concentrate on the technical and work together with uh, somebody who can coach the process. Um, I would be no good coaching the process <laughs> as well. So, um, does that help? Yeah. yeah? Here. Yeah, question. Hello? Is someone going to give this guy a microphone? Hello. Ooh. <laughs> okay. Uh, you, uh, as a, as a, as a um, technical agile coach, working uh, using mod programming in real code bases, H how did you handle uh, the complexity? I mean, each, each, each code base can be really complex, and uh, the domain, also the code, the technical depth, and so on and so forth. How, did you, how much did you, did, you, did you have to understand the code in order to be a good coach? Right, you're asking a really um, important question. Can I, how is it possible to be effective when you don't know the code base? Um, you don't know the domain. Um, actually, I've mobbed with teams where I don't even really know the programming language. Uh, um, the thing is, I do know test-driven development. And I know that pretty well. And when you get down to the level of classes and methods, uh, the domain isn't so important. Um, the rest of the code is not so important. Really, you can. You just focus in on, on the parts of the code that you're working with and how to test drive that. And the thing is, the team that you're mobbing with, they, they know the code base, they know the programming language, and they know the domain. So all I need to do is prompt them with the TDD. And actually, I can do that. I, my experience is that I can be pretty effective doing that after a very short time of just seeing a, a small part of the code base. Um, so. Uh, 
I don't know if that really answers your question. I'm basically saying, look, it works <laughs> um, in my experience. Uh, but yeah, it's, um, it's not, it's not e easy to, to, to do, perhaps, but my experience is it's the much bigger problem is that the skill of the team in TDD than the, the, the domain and the code base and the language. OK, I've probably got time. Probably got time for a few more questions. So um, we have one from the front. There's a lot of questions here, so I'm sorry. I'm going to go. Hi. Um, so this is another question to, um, about smart programming. Um, so how do you fit it from a resourcing perspective? And how do you fit more programming into the schedule of a team that develops a product for an external customer that imposes their own pace of the, you know, the development cycle? And they might have, um, you know, um, they might have multiple features being developed in parallel, where that makes it really difficult to actually get the whole team together down tools and just concentrate on a single feature or a, um, a single uh, part of the system. So how do you make that compatible? How do you, make, how do you sell mock programming to someone that's not your own company? Yeah, that sounds tricky. Uh, so you have to find some enlightened uh, managers to talk to. So the first part of this talk was all about technical agile and why that is so important. And those arguments uh, work on managers to some extent. They can understand those arguments to some extent. And it, what, what you're saying is that we're, we're going to invest uh, some time in more programming in order to uh, increase our skill at TDD. We're going to increase our collaboration. We're going to um, address some of our technical debt. And we need to make space in our schedule for this. So let's take on slightly fewer features this iteration so that we have uh, some slack. Um, usually, it takes some slack to learn a new skill. And managers, if they see the value in what's going to come out of that time, they will normally can be persuaded to give you that time. Um, but yeah, organizations vary. I've been privileged to work with some very enlightened managers, <laughs> perhaps. Thank you. OK, so, so I will use uh, my time then. Uh, about the schedule of your day then, uh, if you are doing those co agile, uh, like technical agile coaching, it's like two weeks every day you are meeting with the team with the mob programming or like some other schedules? Yes, that's exactly what it means. Every day is the same three teams um, for two weeks so that you're reinforcing the, the behavior every day um, and then you go and let them try and carry on. And then you come back and lift them up from where they've got to and say, all right, we're doing this again. Two weeks. It's long enough to make shift the needle, I think. OK, I think we've got time for one more question at the, uh, at the back. Have you got any good techniques for, or any techniques, for helping people, when you're mobbing, for helping people who are not good in groups? Right. <laughs> so having the roles helps, making it very clear what the roles are, that when you're the driver, you're, you're just typing. That's the easiest role. And if you're the navigator, that's the hardest role because you have to verbalize uh, the code. And even if you're uh, not uh, a kind of a people person and you don't have the best social skills, if you can code, then you can do the navigator role because you're just coding, except you're coding with, by speaking the code. And so that's OK. And then the roles for the other mob members is, is mostly not to say very much. Uh, but unless you feel that you have to because something is going wrong and you, or you don't understand, and then you're asking questions. So I think even for people who, who struggle in social situations, because you've given them a very defined role of what interactions they're expected from them, people can, uh, can get hold of that. The harder part is when you have the whiteboard discussion and everyone is contributing to the, to the design. That is much harder for people who, who struggle in social situations. But Again, just by practicing it and having the group uh, show kindness and respect and consideration for one another, you can, uh, you can hopefully draw that person into the discussion. Hope that helps. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.